Another year, another playoff exit for the Philadelphia 76ers. Now, I do want to start by saying that this doesn't feel the same as an every year playoff loss. That I do understand this will go down in the context, that this will be lost in the narratives of basketball history of it just being a first round exit for the Sixers team. But I don't think that quite sums it up accurately. This team fought. This team scrapped. This team didn't roll over in the way that we've seen from Sixers teams in years past. And to give a little hat tip to this next team, I've been pretty consistent for the start of this series that I thought these were the second and third best teams in the Eastern Conference. There's very much another world where the bracket aligns differently, where this is a conference semifinal or even conference final, and we have a whole different tune about this series. But nonetheless, it is a first round exit, and the Knicks did get the job done. To sum it up completely, it was a 118 to 115 victory. There's a lot of places to play, put the blame on here. That to go down, Joel Embiid dropping 39 points, also added 13 rebounds, 3 assists, um, played very well. Joel left everything that he had on here, and to speak on that, I do think one of the positives of this playoff run as a whole, we did see some of the Joel Embiid playoff narratives fall apart, that he gave everything he had this series. He was the best player on the floor, that with him being on one leg, half a face, and whatever else was wrong with him. But there are some places that we can also play some blame. And to dive back into the box score here, it's tough to look much farther than the guy Tobias Harris in 29 minutes of play finished with a whopping zero points in action. What a poetic end to a guy that never quite was able to fulfill the expectations of the contract that he was handed to put up zero points in an elimination game. But shout out to Tobias Harris there. Now, there were some other positives in the series. We saw Tyrese Maxey begin to grow up, saw him take that step forward where he can be the number one option in stretches in a way that the Sixers team will need him to be in the foreseeable future. We also saw Kelly Oubre just deliver and play at the level, contribute to winning basketball in a way that I think a lot of people question was even possible. Saw some other guys step up around the edges. We got the Buddy Heald game last night, and to touch on that specifically, 20 points off the bench for Buddy. Shot 6 of 9 from 3, also had 4 rebounds there. He did miss the potential game tire at the end, rushed the shot a little bit, didn't love the look there. But the bottom line is, it was nice to see a pulse from Buddy Heald. That, that was the midseason acquisition, obviously did not change the outlook of the Sixers team. But it does change the outlook for what the future is for Buddy Heald, both on an individual standpoint. He definitely earned himself a little bit of extra coin by doing that last night. And then from the team concept, that I don't think you should write off Buddy Heald. That we now saw a little bit of what the appeal is. We saw the player they thought they traded for. That We know historically he's been a 40% shooter on over 7 attempts per game throughout his career. I believe in the baseball card statistics there. That I do believe that he's closer to that than the way that he played because there's so much data to back it up. But I do want to talk a little bit about these Sixers on the wider scale here. That I know we got lost, that we bought in, myself included, at the forefront of this. But the bottom line is, this was not an all-in year. That this was a season in which there was a ton of uncertainty. Don't forget that this season, P.J. Tucker started multiple games for his team to start the year. That James Harden entered the season amid his holdout, holdout where there was the fight. Him holding up the Daryl Morey is a liar signs. That all happened leading into this year. It is tough to begin with that, to have to make that trade, which they ultimately did, and the prize of that trade being draft picks, which the Sixers still hold possession of, and still find a way to have a, a competitive team. Now, to Daryl Morey's credit, to the Sixers team credit, they did Frankenstein enough, uh, enough of a contender to, to begin to believe in. That guys like Kyle Lowry joining the buyout market, the additions like Buddy Heald, a guy like Kelly Oubre playing far above expectations, guys like Ricky Council making an impact that I don't think everyone expected going into the year. There was enough to buy in when you have players the caliber of Joel Embiid and a guy beginning his superstar stardom rise like Tyrese Maxey. The team has a puncher's chance. It just didn't land in this one. But I did want to speak a little bit optimistically about the future because Daryl Morey's game plan is still well with an action. And what I specifically mean there is now that we have turned a new leaf, that we're into the next season as the Sixers season is now officially in the books. Look at this active roster for next year. It's Joel Embiid under contract. It is Ricky Council IV under contract. There is a club option for Jeff Doughton. And I will also note that the Paul Reed contract is non-guaranteed. So no longer is he directly on the books for that $7.7 million. That, of course, was tied to uh, them making it past the first round. That was one of those intricacies that Danny Ainge of the Utah Jazz put to try and lure Paul Reed away. That the deal being that 
the contract would become guaranteed if the the team that he was with, with he, which he signed the contract with, made it past the first round. The reason that he did that is obviously the Utah Jazz didn't even make the playoffs, and there wasn't really any expectations that they would at any point leading into this year. So far more likely for these Sixers to be in that spot than the Jazz. little hat tip to Danny Ainge for playing with the fine margins there. But the bottom line is it does not matter. And frankly, from Paul Reed's standpoint, I think it's going to cost him a pretty penny as well because there's no doubt that his stock price as a player was far higher last offseason than it is at this current state. And to dive into him last night, Paul Reed was not his fault. He was not far from the reason that they lost the game. But in his eight minutes of play, I believe it was closer to seven, he had zero points. He had one foul. He had one steal and four rebounds. 0 for 1 from the field. Just not a lot there. And what was even more noticeable is how directly that the Knicks game plan changes when Paul Reed steps in the game. That they attack the rim at a level which they simply don't with Joel Embiid on the floor. Now, honestly, we get it. Joel Embiid's an MVP candidate, one of the better defensive players across the entire league, a top five big man defender, no doubt in my mind, a top five rim protector, a guy that has a far better case for defensive player of the year on a year in and year out standpoint than he gets credit for. So I understand being intimidated driving at him. But if you're Paul Reed, you're here to do somewhat of the same job that you have to protect the rim, have to defend at a high level. And I do think that he didn't take these strides forward in his game that it was hoped this year. Now, the other conversations here is once again, moving forward for the Sixers team to look at some of the expiring contracts that are coming off the, the, the books. There is going to be some tough decisions to make looking down Tobias Harris, thankfully getting those $40 million off the books. Buddy Heald will be interesting to see what his market value is. Nico Batum has talked about retiring plenty, but frankly, He's got life left in his legs and was very useful on this team. So I'd love another season with Nico Batum. Robert Covington, he will be a free agent. Have no clue what his value is based on him missing basically the entirety of the year due to injury. DeAnthony Melton also has injury concerns, and I'm curious what his market value is. Then we got a, uh, Tyrese Maxey with the restricted free agent tag there. And to dive into that specifically, Tyrese Maxey will be signing a five-year contract worth $205 million. That is what his maximum value is at this point due to the standards that him making an all-star game and the other qualifications that he had. I do think that's an important, uh, important distinguishing point to make that a max contract is not a max contract. That a max contract is different to every single player based on the accolades that they have, other accomplishments that they have. Exactly. Like if you make an all-NBA team, make an all-star team, make a, or have an MVP votes, all these kind of things change what you can offer a player, as well as how many years you're in the league and with a specific team. That teams that you stick with for the long run can offer you more money. But for Tyrese Maxey specifically, I do expect it to be a five-year, $205 million contract, and I expect him to earn every penny of that. That is not a guy that I have doubts about taking the next step, and we only have really reasons to be more reassured about that after this season. But to dive into a couple more, of course, there's Kelly Oubre Jr. I would love to have back in a Sixers uniform. Loved having him on the team this year. And then Kyle Lowry. It'll be interesting to see if he decides to hang it up or if he wants to give it one more run, one more season. The guy's 38 years old. I certainly could not blame him either way. And to be honest, he's another guy who put up zero points last night. So while I would appreciate him being around, I think we're past the point where we can, can uh, rely on Kyle Lowry to swing a playoff series. Now, we're already beginning to see some of this smoke coming out about where these Sixers could be looking to spend this money. And just to acknowledge it once again, that all of this plan by Daryl Morey, and to read this directly from Hoop's reference here, he says, the plan was always to open up flexibility for this offseason, and now the Sixers have the most money to spend in the NBA, plus four first-round picks to dangle in trades to finally construct a roster that isn't held down by Tobias's monstrosity of a contract. All eyes now turn to Morey. And as you can see, looking at some of the teams already over the second apron, teams like Boston, Denver, Phoenix, and the teams below that with money to spend, the Sixers. Look at the teams that, that they're in the mix with. The Detroit Pistons, who are obviously very young, very underperforming. The Utah Jazz, very young, still trying to find their direction. And the OKC Thunder, who are in a world of their own as far as being one of the best spots for the long-term outlook for the NBA. But it's the Sixers right in that same conversation with it, that you will not find very many situations in which a team has a legitimate MVP candidate has an up-and-coming star and has room for a max slot and plenty of other money to offer to players that is a great spot to sit in and to jump into the quote from brian winhurst which we're already hearing here he says quote but you don't just have to use cap space on free agents you can use it in trades and this is where i think daryl morey is going to work there's going to be a number of names that are going to come up but i'm going to give you two two off the bat here the first name to watch is jimmy butler 
Also, another player to watch, Brandon Ingram. Ingram is a player who might be on the market, and again, I don't think he will be their number one choice behind Paul George, but this is, uh, but this of a player is who Philly could potentially look at to add firepower to their offense and to their team. So a lot of names there. I only expect there to be more moving forward. We will have videos dropping on each of those individual players looking a bit at their market value, their potential fit on the Sixers right here on Sixers Digest. But for the time being, I just want to take that as a positive that we're already seeing the Sixers in these types of conversation, that they're ready to be spenders, they're ready to be in the mix, and Daryl Morey is going to be at the forefront of all this, that so much of his tenure in Philadelphia has been spent undoing past wrongs. It's time to paint the picture how he sees fit. And that ultimately will make or break what the future of this Sixers organization is. Joel Embiid spoke a little bit post game about the lack of continuity, how there hasn't hasn't been this core in place pretty much ever during his career. That's been a revolving doors of players around him. This is the opportunity to build a true team that, while Joel Embiid's championship window remains open, him sitting at 30 years old right now, if you can get a nice core for three to four really solid runs at this championship window. I think you got a good chance, but you got to find a way to get the right pieces to make that happen. We're going to be breaking it down every step of the way right here on Sixers Digest. Once again, unfortunate the Sixers season did come to the end a little uh, sooner than I think any of us wanted or expected to be the case, but ultimately, that's how the cards were dealt. So appreciate each and every one of you for tuning into this video. Drop your comments. Let me know your thoughts. Air out your frustrations to me. Believe me, I hear it. Make sure you're dropping a like and subscribing to the channel to keep this Digest family growing. I'll be talking to you next time. Peace.